Okay. Uh, this lecture is about the ultrasound of the neck. And uh, in this lecture, we will speak about different subjects. This is the content of this lecture. And th this lecture will exclude the ultrasound of carotid arteries and cranial ultrasound. First, we will speak about the radiological investigations. And first, we will talk about the ultrasound. The advantages of ultrasound is, is that it's low cost, it's available, it lacks radiation exposure, and uh, you can do also guided biopsy. And uh, it's an investigation of choice in the thyroid examination. These, as, these advantages are it's an operator dependent and the deep structures of the neck cannot be seen by the ultrasound. Then we have also MRI. Uh, in MRI, you have lack of radiation exposure. And that's a good ad an advantage of it. And disadvantages, uh, MRI is, uh, is uh, highly costly and uh, the duration of the examination is long and it is not available in every region. Uh, then we have CT scans. The CT scan, this advantage is it has, uh, uh, the technique is, depends on the x-ray, so you have radiation exposure and availability depends on the region, but the duration of the examination is short. It's more shorter than the, the MRI. And then we have fluoroscopy. When you see it here, uh, in fluoroscopy, you give contrast media to the patient and uh, you uh, take pictures or follow the swallowing to see the function of the swallowing and also the shape of the uh, morphology of the throat. It's called video fluoroscopic swallowing study. Also PET, PET CT and PET MRI can be used in, in uh, which they, we use radioactive substances and then we will uh, see if there is uh, highly active metabolic processes in the body. Nowadays, plain X-ray has little role in the uh, investigation of head and neck. Head and neck anatomy is very complex that you have in a small area, a lot of structures. So they have divided uh, the region to different spaces and that will uh, help us in uh, giving better differential diagnosis and more accurate diagnosis. Also the neck has been, uh, the lymph node regions has been divided to different regions. Ultrasound in general, the machine is composed of a computer, a keyboard, a control board, and a screen, and a probe. The probe also called transduced cell. Between the probe and the skin of the patient, we put gel. It will help the, transform, the transporting of the ultrasound waves into the body. And these probes, we have different probes, but the one which we use it in the neck is uh, this linear one, which is uh, with a high frequency for better imaging of the superficial structures and vessels. And usually the one we use it, it's about five to 12 megahertz frequency of the waves. Ultrasound in general, we have the B image. For example, if you look at the, uh, these pictures, the first one is, uh, is of the kidney, the, picture, the ultrasound picture of the kidney, and this is the B image, sometimes called grayscale image or two-dimensional image. Then we have Doppler technique, the color Doppler. When you see it, we see the blood vessels. Uh, if the flow towards the probe, it will be red color. If it's away, it's uh, uh, 
uh, blue color. And then we have power Doppler. In the power Doppler, the power Doppler is more sensitive to the slow, uh, to show the blood flow. So it is uh, when you have a slow and a small blood volume, it can be seen better in the power Doppler. And the evaluation of perfusion or infarction will be done better in this, uh, by this power Doppler. Then we have spectral Doppler, when you can see the waves in a spectrum uh, in two dimensions, we see the velocity and the time. And uh, accordingly, we can see changes in the waves in the systolic and diastolic waves. Let me come and go through the, the structures of the head and neck, which can be examined by the ultrasound. First, the salivary glands. We have major salivary glands, three of them parotid and submandibular glands. The sublingual gland, this is the parotid, this is the submandibular, this is the sublingual. Sublingular is more difficult to be examined by the, by the ultrasound, mostly by MRI and uh, CT scan. And in this picture, you see the, the green one is the parotid, the blue one is the submandibular, and the uh, yellow one is the sublingual. The ultrasound is the first line of examination for the salivary glands, and the salivary should be examine two direction. Uh, the other part of the neck should be examined also when you are examining the salivary glands to see if, there's, if there are any other lesions or infadenopathy. Uh, usually it support the, the differential diagnosis. And uh, at the same time, if it needed, we can do ultrasound guided biopsy uh, in the, one negative thing that the, in the ultrasound of the parotid gland, the, the, the deep lobe uh, partial, partially invisible. You cannot see all the deep lobe, the whole, the whole of the deep lobe. Uh, and we have to know that only in the parotid gland we can see lymph nodes, not in the submandibular or sublingual. There are Diseases and lesions in the salivary gland. This is the list, and when you go through this list, first acute saladenitis. Uh, it's an acute inflammation of the glands. The patient have swelling and pain. The causes they might be viral or bacterial. In the ultrasound, this is the parotid. That is some mandibular we can see uh, that the, the gland is uh, enlarged, it's hypoechoic, it's inhomogeneous, you have multiple small oval uh, hypoechoic areas, the blood circulation uh, increase, and you might have reactive lymph nodes. And other thing is abscesses in the salivary glands. Uh, for example, the causes might be as a result of a acute saladenitis or dehydration or a stone or fibrosis in the main duct of the gland. In the ultrasound, this is a patient. First, he has been, he was uh, examined by CT scan and they saw this lesion here in the left part of the gland. They done ultrasound, and there is an uh, hypoechoic region. Uh, in the ultrasound, it depends uh, on uh, on the stage of the abscess. In the early stage, it is hypoechoic. In the late stage, it is anechoic. Uh, so they do fine needle aspiration. And they examined the patient by Amari after two months to see if, the, if it is being increased, decreased in size or uh, the, uh, to also to exclude any tumors. Uh, 
And this is another patient with the same thing. You have an hypoechoic area. Uh, this may contain debris uh, inside. So you will see hypoechoic region inside the hypoechoic area. Then we talk about chronic saladenitis. Uh, the patient will have intermittent or persistent swelling and pain. It might be associated with meal or not. And in the ultrasound, as we see here, this is the left side of mandibular gland, and this is the right side. And the right side has been usually the chronic salinitis. The gland is smaller due to atrophy. And you see hypo, it's hypoechoic, inhomogeneous, <laughs> and you see multiple small round areas uh, with low echoes and the bus circulation might be normal. Then we come to the salivary stones, which called also salivary calculi or salolithiasis. Uh, when you have frequent swelling of the salivary gland while eating, usually it is in the submandibular gland it can be multiple, and usually the stone is in the main duct and can cause peripheral or total blockage, uh, uh, sorry, partial or total blockage. Uh, and with this, you might have simultaneous inflammation, sometimes superadded bacterial infection, infection leading to adenitis and abscess. In the ultrasound, so these are different patients. The first line, you see a hyperechoic region. Behind it, there's an acoustic shadow. So this is the stone. This is the submandibular uh, gland, which is hypoechoic, inhomogeneous. And in the CT scan, you see that the submandibular gland is uh, swollen. Uh, inflamed, and behind it there is an abscess. And in the CT scan uh, bone window, you see the stone. This is another patient. This is the stone, and you see that the intraglandular duct has been widened. Another patient. This is the stone, and you see hypoechoic. Genicity inside the gland. The same patient has an MRI. This is the gland. This is the duct. And you see in the beginning of the duct, you have a small dot here. That's the, the, the same stone. And this is the par parotid gland. And in front of it, you see a stone because the duct goes anteriorly. So this is a stone in the duct of the parotid gland. Then there are other uh, diseases and situations in the salivary gland. One of them is called cyanosis, which is non-inflammatory, non-malignant, recurrent painless swelling of the salivary gland, and usually bilateral, usually in the parotid glands, and it might be and, uh, so it associated with endocrine diseases, malnutrition, liver cirrhosis, alcoholism. And they are usually hyperechoic with normal blood circulation. Also, we have a syndrome called Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, it's an autoimmune disease. It's a chronic disease. It's more in women over 40s. When you have a patient with dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, and changes in the salivary glands, usually all of them. The changes are inhomogeneous, several small oval hypoechoic or non-echoic regions, like here you can see it, and normal blood circulation, then you can say that this is uh, Sjogren's syndrome. So the clinical and the radiological imaging both together give you a clue to the Children syndrome. Then we talk about the tumors of the salivary gland. 
70 to 80 percent of the salivary gland tumors are benign and 80 to 90 percent of them located in the parotid gland. Uh, 10 to 20 percent located in the submandibular gland but it's important to know that half of them in the submandibular gland are malignant. This is a list of the benign tumors in the salivary gland. This is the malignant tumors. And you can see that the benign, in the benign, so you see schwannoma, which is a nerve tumor. You see lipoma, which is fat tumor, hemangiomas. So it depends on the structure of the gland. It contains also tumors, fats, and others. Uh, benign tumors, the most common benign tumors is the pleomorphic tumor, adenoma, which consists of 60 to 90 percent of the old tumors of the parotid. And usually in women over 40s, they might be, they are usually solitary, sometimes might be uh, uh, more, but usually solitary and unilateral. It grows very slowly, it's asymptomatic, uh, rarely changed to malignant, but uh, during surgery, the surgeon should be very uh, the, the, cap the capsule should not be ruptured because it leads to, to multifocal visual tumor. In the ultrasound, this is the submandibular gland with a pleomorphic adenoma, but it's, it's more rare. The more common is in the parotid. This is the parotid, and this, this is also parotid. You can see this is the superficial lobe, the deep lobe. In between them, you see a hypoechoic, well-defined bulging on the edge, uh, a homogeneous hypoechoic region. And this is in the MRI, you can see it. This is another patient, also the same uh, hypoechoic, well-defined region. Um, you can see it also in the uh, MRI. The second most common benign tumor is Warthin tumor. They are mainly in parotid, mainly in the superficial lobe, the lower edge of the superficial lobe, mainly in men over 15 years old, smokers, <laughs> and usually they are solitary, unilateral, but sometimes they can be bilateral and multifocal. And rarely they, are, they change to malignant tumors. In the ultrasound, these are two different patients. You can see a novel, well-defined, hypoechoic region with, it contains several anechoic regions and it contains uh, many blood vessels. This is the same lesion you can see it in the MRI. Then we talk about the malignant tumors of the salivary glands. Mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, tumors of the parotid gland, less than 30% are malignant. Of the submandibular gland, about 50% are malignant. And usually these malignant tumors are growing faster, they are painful. If it's in parotid gland, they might cause paresis or paralysis of the facial nerve. These are two different patients. Usually the malignant tumors are irregular in shape, irregular in margin and margin in the hypoechoic they are inhomogeneous, they can be cystic or cystic solid. They may resemble a benign tumor, as in these two patients. They look like a benign tumor. They are well, uh, not ill, the margin is not irregular and the shape is not irregular. And you have to know that vascularization is not a pathognomic for, for malignant tumors, because as we see in the Warthin tumor, there's a lot of vascularization, which is a benign tumor. And uh, you have to know also that malignant tumors are rarely multifocal. So in this patient, you see 
this hyperic region when they uh, examined him with uh, by MRI this this um, uh, irregular shape irregular marriage in with the uh, cystic changes inside also in the salivary gland we can see cysts really they are really simply simplex cysts uh, they might be congenital as the first branchial cleft cyst or might be acquired as a cell cell radiotherapy can affect salivary glands in the acute phase they swollen in the chronic phase they atrophy so they they, they seen as hypoechoic in homogeneous there might be also trauma hematoma fluid collection we will come to another organ which is called thyroid gland thyroid gland lesions are mostly incendacoloma they increase with age. Generally, they are benign uh, adenomas, scoliosis, cholecystis, and gota. And seldom we see malignant tumors. First, we talk about th thyroiditis, then benign lesions, and then thyroid tumors. And thyroid tumors might be primary. As you see, the, more, the most common is the papillary thyroid carcinoma, which is 80% and then lymphoma and metastasis. Thyroiditis is the inflammation of the thyroid gland. For example, in Hashimoto's disease, as you see in two different patients, in the early stage, in the acute phase, the thyroid gland is enlarged, hypoechoic, heterogeneous structure, and uh, in the chronic stage, it will become smaller and atrophic. And sometimes it will give off a pattern. And as you see in two stages, in the early stages, there's a uh, lot circulation has been increased. Then we have adenomas. They are benign tumors. They might be active or inactive, uh, depending on uh, producing thyroid hormone or not. There are many follicular, sometimes papillary adenomas. They are solitary and they are well defined and uh, they are hyperechoic or isoechoic and homogeneous. Then we have goiter, which might be diffuse goiter, which is more common, and all multi nodular goiter. Uh, there are different causes, but mainly it's, uh, it's a uh, iron deficiency which causes good. In the ultrasound, this is a diffuse goiter, this is a multi nodal goiter. In the ultrasound, you can see solid or cystic uh, uh, lesions, uh, cystic degeneration, hemorrhage, calcification, and when goiter or the thyroid gland enlarged, it might go retrosternal region or to the retropharyngeal spaces. How we can know uh, what are the indications for malignancy of the thyroid nodules? There are a list of things that you have to check to, to decide whether it is benign or malignant nodule. Microcalcification, the specificity of this is 95%. As you see here in this one, in this lesion, you see microcalcification. If you have a lesion, more than one centimeter has calcification, you have to take biopsy. If it is less than one centimeter, but the patient is young and has uh, uh, risk factors, so you have to take biopsy. Also macro calcification, as in this patient. Extra nodular growth, so the, the lesion grows outside the thyroid gland. Uh, when the lesion is strongly hypoechoic, it has the same echogenicity at the strap muscle. For example, 
in this patient, you see the lesion and then the, the echogenicity is like strap muscle here. So the other one is when the lesion is ill-defined, if the margin is ill-defined. If you have if we have hollow sign, it's a good sign. If no, it's a bad sign. And then we have to see the shape. If it is if it is taller than white, like in this one and in this one, like this, it's a bad sign and we have to take a biopsy. Also, if you have increased central vascularity. But the size is not very important because also, benign lesions grows with time, and we have uh, malignant lesions like papillary thyroid carcinoma, which is mostly, which is the most common tumors. It grows slowly. It is usually small and grows slowly. So each lesion we have to if they were evaluated separately. This lesion, which is surrounded by green color, they are benign. I, you have, it, it does not need to be followed, or uh, you don't have to take bias. This is a spongy form. These are cystis. These are cystis solid. Uh, these are solid lesions. And if you like, you can, in the net, just there are different uh, sites. This is an American uh, association of endocrine surgeons. It uh, shows you different lesions uh, from benign to highly suspicious, and you can compare it if you find a lesion. And uh, accordingly, you can take the vibes. Uh, then we speak about the malignant tumors of the thyroid gland, the papillary thyroid carcinoma, uh, which is the most common, uh, usually in young age, grow slowly, have a good prognosis. Uh, uh, they have good uh, prognosis and uh, they met, when they metastasize, they metastasize to the cervical lymph nodes and rarely to distance uh, region. In the ultrasound, you see an ill-defined as uh, here, and it has microcalcifications and uh, increased vascularity, uh, usually uh, solitary, but might be uh, multifocal. And uh, you also see pathological lymphoids. Then we have follicular carcinoma, it's about 10% that usually resemble benign follicular adenomas. They are hyperechoic and or hyperechoic. Another one is medullary carcinoma, which is also uh, not common. And uh, they are neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, they secrete calcitonin, they are usually hyperechoic solid uh, may contain calcification and usually multiple. Then we have anaplastic carcinoma, which is also rare, but uh, usually in the elderly patient, it has a bad prognosis and they are aggressive in the surrounding structures. Uh, as you see in this patient, first we've done the ultrasound, it's a large, heterogenic, extra glandular uh, tumor, biopsy done, then CT scan of the neck and uh, body performed, and uh, the, the report of the pathologist was it was a lymphoma. So anaplastic carcinoma and lymphoma resemble each other. And that's why when you have a, in la a very large extra nodular uh, tumor, you have to take uh, large 
course by uh, course middle vibes. Then we come to speak about the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are we have many lymph nodes, about 200 to 300 lymph nodes in the cervical region. And uh, uh, lymph node involvement is important in the tumor staging and the progresses of the tumors, prognosis of the tumors. And uh, anatomically, these uh, neck lymph nodes are divided into different regions. The largest lymph node is the jugulodagastric lymph node. The minimum diameter is 11 millimeters. And you have to know that when you have a painless slump in the adult, always suspect malignancy. Uh, and you have to check it and uh, if needed, take biopsy. If you have a lymph node metastasis, it worsens the tumor prognosis by 50% if it is unilateral. If it's bilateral, then by 75%. <laughs> extra nodal tumors, when it grows extra nodularly, it worsens the progresses by 50%. So, as we said, the, the lymph node of the neck has been uh, uh, put in different. Uh, they have divided that the, the neck to different regions. And um, for example, the region one, which is one A, one B, this region. If you have a lymph adenopathy in this region, then you will uh, consider that the lesion would be in the oral cavity or synonasal area. And the same for the other regions. You, Every region gives you a clue where would be the, the primary vision. Um, uh, there are different causes for lymphadenopathy. There are reactive lymph nodes. Yes, a response for inflammation or suppurative uh, when you have an infection. Infections might be viral, bacterial, mononucleosis, toxoplasmosis, or tuberculosis. In autoimmune diseases, such as uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, in sar sarcoidosis, and tumors, which might be primary tumors like lymphomas, leukemias, or metastasis. And here you have different, in different patients, different uh, lymph node, uh, metastatic lymph nodes. How we evaluate a lymph node? First, by the size. Uh, as we said, the jugular gastric lymph node is the, is the larger one. When it goes down in the neck, the, you see more smaller lymph nodes. So according to the region, you see if it is large or not. And the second one is the shape. The shape, this is a normal lymph node. It's long, but it's not so wide. So the length should be two times more than the width of the, of the lymph node. It should be an oval shape. And then we have, the, we have to evaluate the structure of the lymph node. It's hyperechoic with a hyperechoic center, which is the fatty heel. It, be, it should be well-defined. The marriage, margin should be well-defined. And in the lymph nodes, you should not see cystic or necrotic chains, no calcification, no extra nodular growth. So these are different patients. The first row, you see a large lymph node, they have done PET, C, PET CT, there's uh, metabolic activity here, and the primary is, sorry, and the primary is in the left tonsil. For the second row, also we have an enlarged uh, lymph node without uh, fatty helium, 
then the blue MRI, you see a cystic change here. In the ultrasound, also there is an echoic area in the center here. Then they did uh, PET CT, you see activity in its periphery, and the primary was in the base of the tongue. This is a pathological lymph node, an echoic, and in the MRI, you see that this is like a cystic change. Cystic uh, change when you see the, uh, the, the capsule, it's somehow uh, irregular capsule. Uh, so you have to be careful if you see a cystic change in an adult over 40 or 50 years old, and uh, you should exclude necrotic metastatic uh, uh The primary was in the left tonsil. Lymphoma, usually lymph you see lymphadenopathy occurs in different lymphatic regions. In the neck, it might be in the both side of the neck, but you might see in one region or in one lymph node. Also, you might see lymphatic uh, changes in the lymphatic tissue of the pharynx, the tonsils. Uh, usually, they are homogeneous. There are no necrosis or extranodular extension, except when you have an aggressive type of lymphoma. And you have to remember that you have to take a coarse needle biopsy because uh, the diagnosis should, uh, cannot be done uh, on cytology, it should be histopathology. Also, we have cervical tuberculous lymphadenitis. It's infectious disease caused mainly by mycobacteria and tuberculosis. Uh, most, it's the most common form of extrapulmonary tuberculosis. It's a chronic painless mass in the neck. It goes slowly. Uh, uh, as in this patient, you see a pathological lymph node uh, with necrosis. Uh, and in the MRI, you see this is uh, irregular shape. And in the late stage, uh, casation necrosis happens and uh, you have an occult abscess. And you can mm, take fine needle aspiration and uh, for cytological examination or for staining or for culturing. Then the narcissus in thyroglossal uh, in the deck. Uh, one of them called thyroglossal duct which also the other name is uh, middle, the middle cyst. You have lateral cysts and middle cysts. The thyroglossal duct cyst is the most common congenital leg lesion, usually children under 10, 10 years old, and it's more common than the bronchial, bronchial cleft cyst. And uh, it's in the middle line, it might be in the suprahyoid, at the higher level, or infrahyoid. This is the duct, and these are the cysts. So in the ultrasound, you see a cyst. It might contain septa. In the, in the uh, MRI, you see a cyst. If it's infected, and usually it it appears when it is infected. Uh, it is uh, usually without symptom, but when infected, then the patient will come to the doctor and then uh, will be examined and seen. So most of the time you see uh, uh, inf inflammation and infection. The other common cyst is branchial cleft cyst, which are four types. The most common is the type two, and the second common is type one. They are congenital anomalies, diagnosed at young age, they have no symptom unless infected. I don't have uh, type two uh, pictures, but it's usually it's a cyst in the lateral side of the neck between the submandibular and 
sternocleidomastoid muscle lateral to the blood vessels of the neck. They might be small or large. Uh, they have a thin wall, compressible. There's no circulation, blood circulation. There's no solid masses inside. This is a patient, uh, these two pictures are of the type one, brachial cleft cyst. And this patient, as you see from the uh, auditory, external auditory duct, you see um, uh, a duct which comes to the parotid gland and forms a sinus and goes to 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 the to be under the skin like this one these are the changes there are small changes in the in the ultrasound you see just a small cystic change there so you need more examination uh, investigation for example i'm right We have also a cyst called ranula. There are two different types of ranula, a simple ranula and a plunger ranula. The simple ranula is the, in the sublingual space. The other one extends to the submandibular space. The first row, I don't have the ultrasound picture for it, but in the, you see these two are the sublingual glands. And you have a cystic change in the sub mandibular space. It's in contact with the sublingual gland, so it's a plunging ranula. In the submandibular region, also you might have cysts. These are two different cysts. In this one, you see calcification of fat. In the MRI, they look different. These are, this one is epidermoid, and this was dermoid. So in the sublingual region, you might have ranula, dermoid, epidermoid, and lymphatic malformation also. We talk about other lesions of the neck, vascular malformation, they are congenital, Morphological anomalies of various vessels, they might be seen at any age, single, multiple, uh, or may not be part of a syndrome. It might be in different spaces. Usually they are spongy, compressible, not solid. Uh, and de depending on the size, you might see vascular channel inside it. They are hypoechoic, they might contain flavonoids. When they are low flow, they can be uh, classified in two, two, into two types, low flow, vascular malformations, as in venous malformation, lymphatic malformation, and venolymphatic malformation. Or you might have high flow venous malformation, as in arteriovenous malformation and arteriovenous fissure. These are different patients. In the ultrasound, you see this hypoechoic area, it is somehow difficult to, to diagnose it in the ultrasound. Usually they are soft. Sometimes you take biopsy as in this one to see, to uh, see the diagnosis, but MRI is the best way for the, to, to investigate these things. In this patient, you have this is the lesion. This is in the parotid gland. This is the venous malformation. And this was this is the arteriovenous malformation. Then we have lymphatic malformation. There are benign multilocular cystic lesions of vascular origin. They are congenital. Uh, they might be in different spaces of the neck. They have different types, microcytic, macrocytic, mixed types. And uh, in the ultrasound, you see multilocular cystic change, as you see it here. Septa inside, sometimes might be solid regions. Uh, uh, 
and it's compressible. The, in the septa, you might see blood vessels. And as you see it here in the MRI, you see it as a cystic change, which contains septa. Then we come to lipoma. Lipomas are the 15 percent of the life of the body occurs in the head and neck region. They are mostly subcutaneous lipomas. They are well defined, painless masses, enlarged slowly, and uh, they are compressible. Uh, they are similar to the adjustable, adjustable fat. In the ultrasound, you see a fusiform or long shaped encapsulated mass. This is the subcutaneous fat. This is parotid gland, and this is the light color. And in the MRI, you see it is behind the, the parotid gland. And in the MRI, there is a characteristic when you uh, put the fat set on, then you see behave like a fat and loses it is signal. This is a different patient with a retropharyngeal lipoma. This is more difficult to be, it's difficult to, to diagnose it with the ultrasound. And in lipoma, you have to exclude malignant lipoma. If there is septa or blood vessels inside, here we see some. Uh, then you have to take biopsy or, or excise the lesion surgically. Then we come to the needle biopsy. There are two types of biopsy, fine needle aspiration biopsy and core needle biopsy, F, F and A R C and B. Uh, in the fine needle aspiration, we use usually a 22 gauge needle, which is called black needle. And uh, this is the needle and you have uh, the connecting tube and then the rubber sopper syringe. Uh, or you can use this uh, device to suck the content of the lesion into, into the syringe. Uh, uh, if the lesion is uh, uh, if the sample contains blood, then you can use a uh, blue needle, which is 23 gold. If the lesion is deep, uh, then you can use other type of this, the, the long blue or the green needle. Uh, and the sample will be exam examined for cytological, uh, cytologically. Uh, and if the sample is negative, it's not reliable. You have to repeat it. And for tra transportation of the sample, we use 50% of ethanol solution. The coarse needle biopsy, we use in our department two types, and mainly this uh, Biopins Ultra 18 gauge, the second one called Quick Core. They use two different techniques. In this one, the needle goes forward. In this one, the needle uh, stay uh, in its position. This is a pathological lymph node. We see it by color doppler. There's a, this is the carotid artery. And this is a biopsy, a core needle biopsy from the lymph node. The quality of the biopsy will be decreased if the lesion is far away from the skin or if the lesion is small, very small. Or the samples are, if you take a more sample, the more sample, the better will be quality. Mm -hmm. And also the vascularity. If you have blood cells inside the sample, it will uh, decrease the, the quality of the sample and also if you have a cystic or necrotic lesion. So if you have a cystic or necrotic, you have to take the 
a sample from from the the, the content of the cystic lesion and also from the 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 periphery of the lesion. You have not to take biopsy if you see if you suspect carotid bifurcation paraganglioma, as in this patient. You see it here, and it's a picture of it. So we will not take a biopsy because the, uh, there's a risk of bleeding. Also parathyroid, as in this patient, we will not take because it leads to fibrotic reaction, adhesions, and alteration of the histological sum. Uh, if you take a biopsy and the patient have a severe sharp pain, it might indicate that this uh, tumor might be associated with uh, nerves. Schwannoma or neurinoma, as in this patient, this is the parotid gland. You see a large hyperechoic lesion in the MRI. You see it comes out from the facial nerve canal into the parotid gland. So it was a shandoma. So we will, for each region, I will uh, tell you quickly what we will take. The thyroid gland, we almost take fine needle biopsy, except it's a large tumor, we expect we suspect anaplastic or lymphoma. For parotid gland, we take coarse needle biopsy if it's possible. For the superficial lobe, it's, if it's more than one centimeter, but not for the deep lobe, because between the superficial and the deep lobe of the parotid, you have the facial the nerves and the blood vessels. So it's better to take fine needle for the deep lobe if the lesion is visible. Uh, fine needle also can be ta taken from the lesions of the superficial lobe if it's less than one centimeter. For the submandibular gland, we take core needle biopsy. But if the lesion is under one centimeter, then we can take fine needle biopsy. In the lymph nodes, we will take fine needle biopsy if the lymph node is pathological, but it's small. But if it's large and we suspect squamous cell, uh, squamous cell carcinoma metastasis, or we suspect thyroid gland metastasis, then we can take fine needle biopsy. But if it's large or we suspect lymphoma, so we have to take core needle biopsy. If you have a lymph node with cystic or necrotic metastasis, as for example in P16 positive cystic metastasis of oropharyngeal cancer, we will take either fine needle biopsy or core needle biopsy from the solid component or the periphery of the lymph node. In cystic lesions of the neck, we will take fine needle biopsy, aspiration of the content or biopsy of the wall. And uh, the take-home message is ultrasound is the primary radiological investigation for neck lump with fine needle biopsy. In lymphoma, when you suspect lymphoma, a core needle biopsy or lymph node excision is needed. Negative fine needle biopsy is not reliable and cystic neck lesion in adult is malignant unless it has been proven otherwise. And don't forget inhalation. Zor Zor Spas. Thank you very much, Dr. Goran. Uh, thanks for your nice presentation. Uh, if you let me, uh, I can translate your uh, presentation uh, in an abstract to Kormanji, maybe in five minutes. And after that, we can have a question time. Okay? Rush. Rush. Rush.
از لیوکره که یا ترجمه که کرد به کرمانجی از بکنم براستی مجار سر آلتراسوند جبو به منطقه ستوی بو بگشتی دکتر تسبیق بحثا پاثولوژی هن روش کرد و پشتی او هم انجام آلتراسوند که درد کرد جبو او رش حتی و مقارنه او به تایبت امار ای چه دکرد یعنی مثلا در گفت روش لیشن هید تایروید ها روش پاتولوژی او چاوائی و انجام آلتراسوند او چاوائی اون چاوائی دکرن تحلیل بکن انالیز بکن و هر وقت مقارنه بکن به ام آر آی ده دست فکر و دست فکر که ریباز رادیولوژیکال گفت اما چاوائی تحلیل رادیولوژیکال چند ریباز هست ریباز دست فکر آلتراسوند آلتراسوند چند تایبتمندی او هست اون جی دزان تقریبا لاوکاست یعنی به پرهگی کمتر نخوش دکاره آلتراسون چکا رادییشن تونه یه مواد کو رادیو اکتیو تونه براس یعنی باندور کی نبار سر نخوش نکا سر کادر تندرستی نکا لی مشکل آلتراسون چیه اپریتور دیپندنت یعنی براسی اگر پسپور کی وقت وقت دکتر گوران لی آلتراسون چه نکا و تحلیل نکا ده کاره ده انجام ده ده تحلیل شاشتی در بکوه هر وحا او لباتوکی که ده کوهن هندور ده کورن تحلیل اونا باش نکاره چه بکن در وی آلتراسون جبو رادیولوژیکال ایدی ام آر آی هی سی تی هی او روش پی ای تی یا پوزیترون امیشن توموگرافی بگشتی چند ریباس ده یو ایس دا عنوان کر و کو بی ایمیج کو به شکل برایت و گری شکل یا تاری ده به یا هندک سپیتر ده به دوپلر کو دوپلر یا ده کاره به شکل کالر دوپلر به کو ده کالر دوپلر ده او امواج کو ده کوه سر لاش ده کاره بگوهاره یعنی لگوری جوره امواج تو ده کاری فیم بکه کو روشه جریان یا هاتوچون خوینه چاوائی هر وحا پاور دوپلر بو که او زیده هیز یا قوه او امواج خویاده که که ده پاور دوپلر ده ایدی هم نکارین آلی چو یعنی آلی که خوینه ده چه یعنی که درکشن آفلو خوینه هم ببینه هر وحا اسپیکترال دوپلر بو کو در اسپیکترال دوپتر در مید دید او نیشان داده کو درکشن خوینه بر و کی جان آدیه بخصا سالی وری گلند کرد یعنی او قدد از بارم هونه ببینید قدد کو در منطقه در حیث سه جور قدد بود یکی پاروتید کو ایدی زیده در کوه و ملی در ساب مندی بیولار کو در کوه و جهه در ساب لینگوال کو به نزمانی بود ایدی در روشن کو و کو نخوشی یا پاثولوژی در آلتراسون در گفت یک اکیوت سیالیدینیتیس بو که التحاب یا انفلمیشن که در سالیناری گلند در بگشتی یا قده در سالیناری یا بزاق از باورم ببینید او التحاب کچه در بگشتی در گفت سیالیدینیتیس که به شکل ورمی است و لینگ و ایشه که عجیب تیده هایه پرانی به صدمه ویروس و که مامپ ویروس و سایتو مگلوم ویروس و هر وحا استفیلو کوکوس گو روش آلتراسون در اوژی ایدی هون از وارم در صورت در دیتن گلند یعنی او قدم مزین در بی و شکل اوژی زیده هایپو اکویک بو یعنی او منطقه که ام روش تیده در بینین تقریبا تاری در بو هر وحا این هوموجنوس بو و بلاد فلو یا هاتوچون خونی لبی منطقه در انکریز بو زیده بو روش دین آبسس بو یا اوژی انفلمیشن کو دوام بکا دما کو انفلمیشن دوام بکا و چاره سر دوی لبه داره پور چوی دوی یعنی کو محب دوی او کسافت دوی داره و اوژی سدم اکیوت سیالی دنتیس ها دیس ها آتراسون در اوژی هایپو اکویک بو آن اکویک بو روش دین کرونیک سیالی دنتیس بو اوژی دیسا هم دبینین که سویلینگ و پین زیده دبه 
انجام یو اس یا الترسون جی مدید نورمال سایز یا حتی سایز گلند هندک کمتر ده بجه روش نورمال در صورتی جده من دید دیسا پایپو اکویک بو زیده او روشه کو درد کف و هر بها این هوموجینوس بو بحثا سالیواری استان کرد انکو سیالو لیتیاسیس جی تیگوتن دیسا مگو دید کو سویلنگ یا ورم هیه ده گلند ده کو حتی جارنا هیه او استان یعنی او کفرو که چه ده به سده به انصداد یعنی گرتن او مجران ده به که دی دکتر جی نشان داد دما کو کفر هبو چاوا به آوای کی اکوجنیک بوده صورت ده با اساس یالوسیس که دکتر دیس آوجی روشی کی نان اینفلمیتوری بو که جارنا کم ده به جارنا زیده ده به کو زیده ده پاروتید گلنز دا یعنی ده قده دو کله به دره دابو چه ده بو گرده های هندی روش یا نخوشی جدا با وکو لیور سیروسیز یعنی سیروس کبدی و هر وها کسین که الکول زیده مصرف دکن یو ایس او یا آلتراسون در او جمعه دید که براستی او منطقه او گلند مزن در بونو پرژی اکوجینیک بون سیندروم سیوگرمز بسکر او جی به تایبت گرده های روشی که نخوشی نه آتو ایمنه یعنی در مکو سیستم پاراستن لاش یا مناعده به جنات بارم ایرش ویگلنز دکه ام روش دبینی کو سدم زهابون یا حشبون چاو دف دبو کو در یو ایس یا آلتراسونی او مدی دیسا روشگی این هوموجنوس بو و هر وها اسمال هایپوکونیک آریا مدکاری ببینی کو دوی روشی در مدید بلاد فلو زیده دبو